On this episode of Women Behind Bars, one woman is convicted of killing a man she contacted through an online dating service. It just happened so fast into a blink of an eye. It appears that she had some bottled up rage from being rejected. She was extremely out of control and it was a violent death. Then Patricia Donnelly tells her story. She pled guilty to the murder of a stranger she enticed in a swingers club. She was standing there behind him and she took her purple bra off that she was wearing and that's when she all of a sudden threw this bra around his neck and tightened it up and choked him to death. My intention was to have sex, do whatever with this man, get the money and get Michael out of jail. Two women who snapped in fits of rage, two brutal crimes. These are the stories of Alicia Williamson and Patricia Donnelly. On August 5, 2003, police received a dire 911 call. Yeah, just an emergency. I walked in and my, my friend is laying in the hallway and he's, he's bleeding. I don't know if he's breathing or not. When police arrived at the mobile park home, they found 40 year old Robert Atkins Jr., a computer maintenance expert, stabbed to death 27 times. Everybody was extremely emotional, everybody was in disbelief. 37-year-old Alicia Williamson, a single mother of two, confessed to the horrific killing. It just happened so fast into a blink of an eye. It appears that in this case, um, she had some bottled up rage from being rejected. Was Alicia Williamson a time bomb waiting to explode or did she kill in self-defense? Alicia Williamson was born to Carolyn McBride and Willie Conley, who was 12 years older than Carolyn. She was a teenage mother, and I think it was hard on her having two small kids at such an early age. The family lived in the projects west of downtown Birmingham. When Alicia was three years old, her mother divorced her father and told her children he was dead. As a single mother now in her 20s, Alicia's mother wasn't home often to care for her children. My mom, if she wasn't working, you know, she was out having fun, young and free. Alicia watched over her younger brother as they grew up. One Christmas, I remember that we were probably as poor as you were going to get. And she basically recycled something from the year before, but she made me like a necklace. And she gave it to me and says, hey, you know, here's a Christmas present for me. She just wanted to make sure that, you know, I had something. When Alicia was seven years old, the family's financial status stabilized. Her mother married an entrepreneur who adopted Alicia and her brother. Two years later, their mother gave birth to a girl she named Angela, who looked up to her big sister. Alicia was fun and caring and loving. Four years after Angela was born, their stepfather died of a massive heart attack. Again, Alicia's mother was left to support her kids. Then, during Alicia's teens, an incident occurred that would shatter her self-esteem and contribute to her depression as an adult. I was um, raped by one of my cousins. And it was not just once, it was more than once. Alicia said she told her mother, who did not believe her until she learned her daughter was pregnant. She took me somewhere to have an abortion. I can't even remember, but I remember it wasn't good. To make matters worse, Alicia discovered that although her mother worked as a city transit bus driver, she had other ways of making money and coping with her life. I found out in my junior year of high school that my mom was doing drugs. Despite the pressures at home, Alicia studied nursing at college, but dropped out to take care of her mother and sister. When she was 22, she got pregnant by her boyfriend, Freddie Lee Motley, who she says physically abused her. One time he punched me in my stomach, so I had started having problems after that. I went to my last checkup before my delivery, and uh, I had an STD that he had given me. 
In spite of the abuse, they married in February of 1988, just before their son, Freddie Jr., was born. We stayed together until my son was about eight months. In 1989, Alicia's personal life took an unexpected turn when she found out that her mother had lied about something important. An aunt told Alicia that her biological father was not dead, but was living in Southern California and had a family of his own. I called him and um, we talked, and so he sent for me. I found out we have a lot of uh, ways of light. Uh, we're both quiet. We're not really talkative unless, you know, the conversation is really interesting. In December 1991, Alicia gave birth to another child she named Nakia. Those are my miracle babies because um, they always told me I was going to never have children. <laughs> but almost two years later, Alicia suffered a devastating loss when her biological dad, with whom she had reunited three years earlier, died. Without my dad there, I could talk to him about anything, no matter what. Although times were tough for the single mother, she still managed to help her younger sister with her children. When I had my daughters, she, I'm a single mom, she helped me out a lot. <laughs> Taking my burden away from me. While she lost her own father, Alicia married her daughter's dad, Terrence Williamson, and relocated to Atlanta. But just four years later, the couple separated. He couldn't come to a grip that he was a married man, and married men do not stay out all night long. The rejection from two husbands weighed heavily on Alicia's diminishing self-esteem. To lift her spirits, she tried to buy a new car she could not afford by forging a check stolen from a woman she took care of. There are people who want things more than they can have, and that was, at the time, my sister's thought process. That need to have landed Alicia in jail when she was arrested for check fraud in Smyrna, Georgia in June 2003. And that's when her downward spiral began. It just seemed like everything in my life was just going so wrong. When Women Behind Bars continues. I hit him twice in the head. She claimed that Mr. Atkins attacked her, choked her. She grabbed a barbell, struck him in self-defense. In June 2003, Alicia Williamson, a single mother with a history of two failed marriages and suffering from depression, had recently been released from a two-week sentence in jail for forgery. I had just gotten out of jail for like two weeks. I want all, everything to be taken care of, trying to get things in order. Feeling lonely and depressed when she got out, Alicia looked for companionship on an internet dating website. My aunt, it was just telling what kind of person that I was and um, what I'm looking for in a friend. And that's somebody I could go out to dinner with. We saw the site, we saw her pictures. They were very, very, very sexy, very showing a lot. Alicia found Robert Atkins Jr., a former Air Force officer and high school football star whom she had briefly met at a job fair the year before. He was the type of person that would open the door for you, you know, if you're getting out the car. He would run around and he'd open the door for you. He was a, he was a true gentleman. The divorced father had moved to the Charlotte suburb three years earlier to be closer to his 17-year-old son, James. The young man was living with his mother, Linda Bond, three hours away. He was a good father. He was a good dad. Oh, uh, he was, yeah, he's great. <laughs> Uh, he's always watching football all the time, or uh, he's a big Star Trek fan, too. So uh, that was definitely good. Robert is what you would consider a nice guy. He, um, he loved women. He loved prints. He made me feel safe. Robert was also a celebrated officer who had been stationed in England and Italy during his eight years with the Air Force. I think maybe he felt that that would be a good opportunity for him to see the world. He didn't have not an evil bone in his body. He just, he wanted to help people. Alicia and Robert frequently spoke on the phone. It was strange and we really didn't date. I talked to him, it was like he was a confidant for me. This was just on the phone. 
After a month of soul-searching conversations with Robert, Alicia found herself trusting her new friend completely. He was really nice. I mean, he was a really nice person before. He was living in suburban Charlotte, North Carolina, but decided to drive to Atlanta to see Alicia. He was just listening to everything, you know, that was happening in my life, and he was just like, okay, do you want to come to Charlotte and start over? To Alicia, Robert's offer to help her start a new life seemed irresistible. I think that uh, Ms. Williamson had been rejected, um, going through a divorce, um, looking to start fresh, coming to Charlotte. I don't believe she uh, said that they had any sort of intimate relationship. I just wanted a new start where nobody didn't know me and I could just start all over. I guess she would help with the bills. That's not his type of person. Robert dates very quiet women. When I saw her in another picture, she's total opposite of what he likes. Although Alicia says that Robert made no promises of an intimate relationship, authorities believe that she might have harbored hopes for more than just a friendship. We did recover uh, her journal, and it stated that she loved Robert. Uh, so we know that there was a relationship in her mind that she wanted to have with Robert Atkins. Alicia figured she would bring her 11-year-old daughter, Nakia, to North Carolina once she landed a job. In the meantime, she had a relative care for her and left without telling the rest of her family. On July 27, 2003, Alicia moved in with Robert Atkins after a phone relationship only a few weeks old. The first day, it was good. Alicia says that she concentrated on her job search. I had put in resumes at different places to work, and um, actually, the lady had called and said she wanted to interview with me. She was really pleased with my resume. But by the second of nine days that Alicia lived with Robert, she claims things began going downhill. It was just crazy. I could ask him things, and he wouldn't answer me. I mean, he did answer me. It was in a harsh way. I thought it was strange. She called me one day and wanted me to enroll her daughter in school. She then told me she was in North Carolina and she could not get back. And I asked her why she could not get back, and she was like, I'll explain you later. I just can't get back, but I need you to enroll my daughter in school. In the meantime, Robert had second thoughts about inviting Alicia to stay with him. He and a former girlfriend had decided to get back together, but in order for their relationship to work, he told Alicia that she would need to move out. She was being told that he didn't want her living at his place. If there was any relationship that was going to happen between them, it wasn't going to take place now. It was like he was a different person. Like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, he just changed. And I needed to go to the store because I am a diabetic and I, I needed food and he did not want to take me to the store. Cooped up in Robert's home and away from her family, Alicia felt isolated and betrayed. You're supposed to be my friend and, and friends don't treat each other like that. Alicia says she saw some signs of this change a week earlier while Robert was driving her from Atlanta to Charlotte. He didn't even want me to stop to the drugstore to get my medication. The medication she needed was an antidepressant, which she says she took to stay focused. So I had to email my sister, tell her to send me my medicine through the mail. After nine days of living with Robert in a platonic roommate situation, Alicia was becoming depressed and confused because she was without her antidepressants. Having low self-esteem at that time, I wasn't really thinking. The tension between them had grown since Robert had asked Alicia to leave. If I was on a computer, talking to my sister, you need to stay off my computer. Robert decided a solution to getting Alicia out for good would be to pay for a hotel room until the end of the month. But when he returned from work around 9 that evening, he did not discuss that option with her. Instead, according to Alicia, he erupted in anger when he realized that she had been working on his computer. She had used the computer that he had fixed for her, and she had locked it down, uh, preventing him from using it. She claimed that Mr. Atkins attacked her, choked her. 
don't believe she said uh, he may have kicked her in the stomach. Although Alicia claimed she was defending herself, what happened next would indicate she suddenly went out of control. Alicia remembers what she was thinking. I didn't want to be hurt at the bed, you know, verbally, and um, so I'm physical with my first husband. I didn't want to be up like that. It just seemed like everything happened so fast. He grabbed my arm and bent it back. She grabbed a barbell, struck him in self-defense. I hit him twice in the head. So as I was turning around, he grabbed me by my ankle. And I remember I unbuttoned my jeans, and I crawled out of my jeans, and I ran. After that broke up, it looks like that she went into the kitchen area, got a knife, returned. And I jumped across the counter, and I, I grabbed the first thing I saw, and that was a knife. She stabbed him on his uh, left side, the left shoulder area. He had some stab wounds on uh, the right side of his uh, facial area. Then he also had stab wounds on his back. He said, I'm sorry. That's the last thing I heard him say. And then I, after that, everything else a blank. Robert lay dead on the floor in a pool of blood. He would have bled to death, uh, you know, within moments from the injuries that he sustained during the attack. When Women Behind Bars continues... I don't have anything to say to Alicia. May God have mercy on her soul. And later, a brief encounter with a stranger in a swingers bar turns deadly. On August 5th, 2003, Alicia Williamson fatally stabbed Robert Atkins Jr., her roommate of nine days, after the two got in a heated argument. She then called 911. I walked in and my friend is laying in the hallway and he's, he's bleeding. I don't know if he's bleeding or not. Can he contact? I don't know. Uh, it's a lot of blood here and I'm afraid to touch him. Was he assaulted? I'm not sure. Oh my God. Detective Terry Brandon responded to the crime scene with his partner. That area was just extremely bloody. Uh, you could tell that the victim had lost uh, a lot of blood. Aspirated blood was seen on the wall in a window blind. Police arrived. Uh, they found Mr. Atkins in a hallway there in this mobile home. Uh, they noted, and it was confirmed by the medical examiner, he had suffered uh, multiple blunt trauma injuries as well as stab wounds. We believe that the victim was sitting at his desk and was working on a computer with his back to the rear of the door where she would have entered. Uh, she uh, walked in, picked up a, a barbell, and hit him in the head. When investigators first interviewed Alicia, she lied about what happened. She said that it looked like uh, he may have been robbed. What she was saying just wasn't adding up. And she came off of it and said that she would tell the truth. Alicia then claimed that she stabbed Atkins in self-defense. I did not believe that she acted in what she seemed to be claiming to be perfect self-defense. There was a lot of rage and anger that she exerted upon the victim. Um, she was extremely out of control, um, and it was a, a, a violent death. The medical examiner's report showed Robert suffered 27 stab wounds. To my knowledge, I only stabbed him three times, but the autopsy said 27. Police charged 37-year-old Alicia Renee Williamson with the murder of Robert Atkins, Jr. Atkins' sister, Denise, did not buy Alicia's defense that her brother attacked her. He was not aggressive at all, no. He was very quiet, laid back, you know, very calm. Alicia has always been very timid. She's never been the type of person to even ball up her fists at anyone. It was unbelievable. Everyone was stunned. It was a lot of built-up anger, not only from him, from way back when. I was just releasing it. She had some bottled-up rage. Here she is being put out again by someone 
that she thought maybe was going to help her and maybe have a relationship with. Investigators theorize that Robert's rejection might have been the spark that ignited Alicia to snap. Alicia believes it was the final blow in a series of failed relationships and the past alleged physical and mental abuse in her life. The news of the murder came as a shock to both families. I don't have anything to say to Alicia. May God have mercy on her soul. I was working on a project in the Charlotte area, and I got back to my hotel and I turned on the news, and then pops up this report and her picture. Here's my sister right here, Alicia Williamson, on the news um, being held for murder. I told him his father died. And I don't, I, I'm not crying for that, but I'm crying because James's face. I first found out, I, I definitely couldn't take it. As I broke down tears, during the week after the murder, police allowed James, his mother, and other family members to gather Robert's belongings. They tried to look for answers to why his life was taken. From what we saw in the bedroom, she had like a little notebook. And in the notebook, she had wrote Mr. and Mrs. Atkins, Mrs. Leisha Atkins, Mr. and Mrs. Robert and Leisha. You know, she just went page to page to page, hearts, kisses. In her mind, she thought that things were gonna happen. Uh, between them, and that she was coming here to start a new life, and that uh, he was going to take care of her. And their relationship had deteriorated to the point that he just told her he couldn't help her anymore, he wanted her out. That could have been part of what happened was being a victim of her past. Days after Alicia was arrested, Linda Bond and Robert Atkins' younger sister, Jennifer, visited her in prison. According to Linda, his sister was curious about the woman who killed her brother. We had posed as missionaries from the Church of God. Linda said Robert Atkins' sister, Jennifer, was quiet during the visit. She was a little shaken, but she, she was okay. I think in her heart, she had to see, you know, to put an end to it. She want to see the evil. But evil is not what they saw. She came out in that suit. I said, this can't be. She looked like a little girl. She was a little short. I thought I was meet this mean, you know. She looked like a sweet young girl. Alicia says she was never told they were from a church and suspected they might be Robert's relatives. They seemed like they was there out of concern, but I knew deep down they wasn't. After the short visit, Alicia found out that Linda and Jennifer were relatives of the man she murdered. For a second degree murder under North Carolina law, for someone with no record, like Miss Williamson, the maximum one could get, it'd be around 16 years with a minimum 13. But the judge presiding over Alicia's case took into consideration that she had no violence in her past and that she was the mother of two children. I thought the judge imposed a fair sentence based upon her lack of record, um, the circumstances which she claimed uh, caused her to take Mr. Atkins' life. Justice was not served. She only got 10, 12 years. You know, she took a life, a life for a life. She took my brother's life. She should do life. I'm sorry for their loss. I really am because they lost a person, and so did we. He definitely went to a better place. It's just, you know, the way he went. Since she's been in prison, Alicia has taken classes in business management, parenting, and domestic violence. I'm sorry about how things had happened. If I could turn back the hands of times and do things differently, I would. It's just that um, I can't change what happened. I played that scene in my head over and over, over and over. I feel like then I'm giving her another chance, that uh, society is giving me another chance. For her good behavior, Alicia is allowed day passes to see her family outside of prison. She also has been chosen for various work assignments throughout her years.
When Women Behind Bars continues. No matter what I do, it's never going to make amends. I cannot say I'm sorry for this and fix it. He had a mother. She will never see her son. And I did that. For more information about Women Behind Bars, go to WeTV.com. On the evening of June 15, 2000, 23-year-old Patricia Donnelly entered Sans Souci, a swingers club in North Dallas, searching for someone who would trade sex for money. She needed money to bail her husband out of jail. Donnelly found a stranger, 43-year-old Carrie Taylor, a local from the Dallas suburbs, who was interested in her offer. They went to her apartment a half hour away. When they arrived, she changed her mind. She had got him in her house and she had him on a divan and choked him to death. Patricia confessed to strangling Taylor by using an unusual murder weapon. She said she snapped and just tightened the bra down and just kept tightening it until he was dead. Was Patricia Donnelly a cold-blooded killer or did a spontaneous sex act turn deadly? From the very beginning, Patricia Donnelly's life was atypical. I grew up believing that my grandmother was my mother and my mother was my sister until I was about seven years. And then my grandmother told me that my mom was my real mom and she was my grandmother. Her grandmother raised her because she felt her own daughter, Patricia's mother, was too unstable to care for a child. She had problems with depression, uh, took a lot of pills, just was not stable. Even though Patricia's depression was hereditary, she did not feel comfortable talking to her grandmother about how she was suffering. I've suffered depression since I was 10, and I would write that down in my journal. But when she found it, she was mad. And I would suffer consequences. Whatever I loved was taken away. It was a cat or a dress or whatever. Her grandmother's alcoholism spilled into Patricia's upbringing as well. Even as a baby, she was drinking alcohol alcohol in the bottle to make her go to sleep at night. I was drinking peppermint schnapps from age eight. I was probably addicted at 10 years old. She grew up in the clubs every night. Her grandmother was an avid alcoholic and her mother was a drug, had a lot of drug problems. My grandmother, she taught me to play the piano, how to sew, how to cook. She was awesome in that regard and she loved me. But then when she would get drunk, it would turn totally different. If I made her mad, I remember walking past the panel, my face would be cut out of the pictures. Or she um, would cut up my favorite dress. But according to Jason Donnelly, Patricia's former husband, alcoholism was not the only problem she faced as a child. She even told me she was raped. As a, uh, that her grandmother allowed men to come into the house and, and use her for sex. I've been um, sexually assaulted or abused when I was six by um, my uncle. He really wasn't my uncle. The depression, drinking, mental and alleged sexual abuse in her childhood all contributed to a suicide attempt at age 10. I still to this day don't know why. My great grandmother was on Halidol. It was liquid. And I didn't exactly know what it was, but I knew I wasn't supposed to take it. So I drank it and it sent me into shock. Patricia moved from one relative's home to another in her early teens. I know Patty ended up in a foster care because she had so many problems as a child. At age 17, Patricia met Jason Donnelly, who was a plumber's assistant. She arrived unexpectedly at his apartment in Abilene, Texas in 1993. One morning, my cousin knocked on the door at 6 o'clock in the morning and told me they needed this girl to come stay a couple days. Jason took Patricia in. She lived there for six months before he asked her to marry him. I asked Jason to wait and not marry her at that time, but he kind of ran off and got married. Patricia's mother-in-law, Weta Heath, was suspicious of her right from the start. Kind of mysterious. Yeah, she kept to herself quite a bit. In 1994, shortly after they were married, Jason enlisted in the Air Force. They lived at the Shepherd Air Force Base in Texas. The following year, Patricia became pregnant, and in September 1995, 
she gave birth to a baby boy she named Neeland. At first, I was not happy about being pregnant. I'd never been around children. And I was scared. When Neeland was born, I didn't know anything. Jason was gone 12 hours a day. After she had him, she went right into postpartum depression. And uh, we started having all kinds of problems. It wasn't until they had been married for a while that I started finding out the things that she was doing that I thought were wrong, like going out and being with other men, drinking and doing drugs, and being very deceitful to Jason. According to her former husband, Patricia would also sniff paint, which made her hallucinate. She had an illusion. She told me she saw the angel of death face to face try to kill her. She had been huffing paint. I could come in the house and smell a strong smell of paint. Patricia admits to getting high on paint fumes and drinking. She also blames herself for being physically abusive to her former husband and cheating on him. I was very young, and I should not have gotten married at age 17. I was not promiscuous um, in high school, but as soon as I got married, I was. One time, we got in an argument, and she said, I'll break all the dishes in the house if you, if you say anything else. And I did. I said one more thing, and she, she took every dish in the house and busted it. Patricia acknowledges that she was ill-equipped for motherhood since she did not grow up in a nurturing environment. I feel like I was the best mother I could be. With what help I had, what I knew. Her former mother-in-law said Patricia often left her son at her house. She just wasn't able to take care of him. And then when he was just a few months old, she brought him to me and told me I could have him, and that she didn't want him. Jason got Patricia on medication for depression, and the marriage stabilized. In 1998, she gave birth to a second son. She named him Joseph. I don't think any mother's perfect. Um, I never abused them physically, emotionally, or mentally. Relatives said when Patricia was lax in taking her medication, she would return to drinking and drugs. As a result, the marriage completely fell apart right after Joseph was born just as she met Michael Carl Wade. He was a cousin of one of Jason's friends on the military base where they lived. Patricia was smitten with him. I guess he was more of the bad boy, <laughs> um, but he was intelligent. If you caught him on a normal basis, he was a pretty, pretty decent person. He seemed like he, he really cared about her and loved her, but then he would go through really violent periods. In November 1999, Jason and Patricia were divorced, with Jason getting custody of their two sons. Patricia and Michael moved together to Denton, Texas, a half hour north of Dallas. We had a lot of the same likes as Jason and I did not. Um, so that's what attracted me to him. It was an attraction that would prove fatal. When Women Behind Bars continues. That's one of the worst ways to die is, is by strangulation. But it's not normal for a woman to strangle a man. In the fall of 1999, 23-year-old Patricia Donnelly and her husband, Jason, divorced. Jason got custody of their two sons, Neelan and Joseph, and brought them to England, where he was stationed with the Air Force. Patricia moved north of Dallas, Texas, with Michael Carl Wade, who became her common-law husband on Valentine's Day 2000. They were what we in Texas call common-law married. Uh, common-law means if you present yourself as man and wife, then you are believed to be man and wife. They never had a license, but they were married when she called herself Patricia Wade. Heather Disney was Patricia's neighbor at the Thomas Street Apartments in Denton, Texas, where they became close friends. She was very, very sweet. She was very low-tempered and just always wanted to give to other people, always wanted to help everybody out. She said the couple was always fighting about money or about Michael going out with his friends. He would say that she came after him. She would say that he would come attack her, but at the end result, she was always the one that was beat up. And then the next day, it was like nothing ever happened, and there was always an excuse for where the bruises came from. She would just say, I should have just left, but she never did leave. 
On June 12, 2000, a fight between the two was extremely violent. I had heard Trish screaming and walked in the door, and she had come out, and she had blood just coming down her head really bad, and she was trying to get away. Heather said she went to a neighbor's apartment and called the police. She had told the police that she had slipped getting into the bath and busted her head on the bathtub spout. And I told the police, that's not what happened. He's, he was in there beating up on her. Police charged Michael with assault and brought him to the Denton County Jail. They set bond at $250. Patricia frantically tried to get Michael out of jail, but she did not have the money. I wanted to bail him out because I loved him. And I wanted to show him what unconditional love was. She ran around asking everybody if she could borrow $10 here, $20, just trying to get the money together to get him out. And nobody would come up with the money or even attempt to. The only way she could think of to get the money was to, uh, was to hire herself out for sex. On the night of June 15, 2000, Patricia and a friend went to the Sans Souci Swingers Club in Dallas, looking for someone to pay Patricia for sex. Her friend found Carrie Taylor, clean-cut neon sign installer, who was eager to pay Patricia for her services. He was just a good-natured person. Everybody liked him. He had uh, a lot of friends. Carrie, who was divorced from his high school sweetheart, lived on his parents' large farm with his three brothers. He would speak to his parents several times a day. It probably gave people a shirt off his back if, he, if they asked him for it. Yeah, he was kind. He, he was nice to me. According to Patricia, her plan was simple and pragmatic. My intention was to have sex, do whatever with this man, get the money, and get Michael out of jail. We went to a lake. I remember drinking some beers. And then we went back to Michael's in my apartment. Patricia says she knew that Carrie wanted to be tied up, so she arranged her furniture to accommodate him. The way my living room was set up, the couch was in the middle of it, and so the door was behind it. So she took the shoestrings out of her husband's shoes. The couch was moved away from the wall slightly, and she cut a slit behind the couch, and there were springs and framework that run down there. So she had Carrie reach his arms over his head. She tied his wrist and then tied them to the back of the couch. Patricia told police that Carrie began to squirm because she took so long. She was standing there behind him, and she took her purple bra off that she was wearing and kind of danced in front of him a little bit naked, went behind him and asked him if he, if he wanted to be tied up more. But then Patricia claimed she could not go through with it. The thoughts in my head, I did not want to. I didn't want him to be there. I hadn't gotten any money yet. I just wanted all of it to go away. Patricia says she was also angry over the way her two marriages turned out and furious with her mother. It all came out in a flood of rage. I think all my anger from everything, probably from way back yonder, came out on that man. When anger wells up, it's sometimes not controllable. And that's when she all of a sudden threw this bra around his neck and tightened it up and choked him to death. It didn't seem real. I remember walking back pacing and, and crying, but it did not seem real. The following day, having just killed a man and still without cash, Patricia called a friend to help her pay Michael's bond. He put it on his credit card, and I went and got Michael out of jail and told him we have a dead body in our apartment. And when he got home, sure enough, there was a, a dead body rolled up in the carpet inside the living room. So he kind of freaked out. That afternoon, Patricia's neighbor, Heather, came to the apartment. When I went in there the next day, her living room walls were spray painted like a black color. She wouldn't make eye contact. If you asked her anything, she had this smirk smile on her face, this evil, really evil smile almost zombie-like. Just kind of assume that she had sniffed too much pain. Heather also noticed that the apartment furniture was moved around and the bedroom carpet was cut out. I went ahead and sat down and sat on the carpet that was rolled up. The body was still rolled up in the carpet from a day earlier. 
Heather left without noticing. Police believe a day or two later, Patricia and Michael put the body in the back of Carrie Taylor's Dodge Intrepid and drove three hours to Athens, Texas, where she grew up. They had wrapped the body in a leopard comforter and dumped it in a ravine next to a swamp. Michael told me to get rid of his car, and I did not. Patricia continued driving Carrie Taylor's car for almost a month. Then, on July 14, 2000, police stopped her in Denton, Texas, for stealing gas. Investigators had no idea what they were about to discover. She was vague on, on, on what she was doing with the vehicle. At one point, she said that she was buying the vehicle from Carrie Taylor. The car was traced to Taylor, whose parents had reported him missing on June 23, 2000. Detectives held the mother of two at the county jail for questioning, and after five days, she confessed to the murder. Patricia took investigators to the secluded ravine where she dumped Carrie's body. All we had were bones. We collected about 98% of the bones, which in a rural area where you have wild animals is very good. But we found the bra in the area where the bones were found. The bones were sent to a forensics lab for identification. When the lab confirmed the remains belonged to Carrie Taylor, police notified his mother and the rest of the family. She was horrified when she found that they were not going to have a body. Uh, they had bones. They did not have their son. If somebody's planning to kill somebody and they shoot them uh, from f 20 feet away, 100 yards away, uh, it's not as personal as strangulation. You're right there to the last gasp. That tells me that, that she's a very cold person. On July 14, 2000, police charged Patricia Donnelly with murder and Michael Carl Wade with evidence tampering. He went to trial eight months later. The thing that he did was wrong was when he found out about it, uh, he did notify the authorities. He never indicated that he ever helped dispose of the body, but he admitted that he backed the vehicle, that he rode uh, in the vehicle with her when she disposed of the body. That in and of itself is sufficient. No matter what I do, it's never going to make amends. I cannot say I'm sorry for this and fix it. He had a mother. She will never see her son. And I did that. No, nobody else did it. No matter what I've gone through in my childhood, no matter what Michael did to me, it doesn't give me permission to take a life. I hope that she fi eventually finds peace. When Patricia went to prison, her son Joseph was one and Neelan was three. They were too young to even obtain any type of understanding. I explained to Neelan in little kid's terms, mommy's in timeout. He understands a lot more now. The 32-year-old mother has not seen her sons in eight years, but they no longer wonder where she is. I've told them the truth. I debated over that for many years. Recently, I've told them everything. Patricia is at a prison in Gatesville, Texas. She creates cards for Neelan and Joseph and says she thinks about her family as well as Carrie Taylor. I know that I wrecked their life. I have an impact on my children's life by not being there. So I know the damage that I've done to everybody's life. I accept responsibility. I don't blame it on because this happened or that because I make my own choices. 